My name is uh, Ville Tuulas and I'm um, the author of the book Effective Data Science Infrastructure that uh, basically talks about um, about like how to set up machine learning infrastructure, data science infrastructure at most often like at your companies. Um, although, I mean, of course, like if you just happen to be a, like a personal kind of a doing this for personal fun or as a hobby, I mean, for sure, I mean, like you might find these things useful as well. And that may be the same thing in academia as well. But I mean, the fact is that like many of these use cases are especially relevant for, for businesses who want to use machine learning for different use cases. And um, I actually like wanted to start by um, telling something a bit about, about like kind of my motivation for writing the book. And uh, the motivation actually comes from um, Netflix. So I used to be leading the machine learning infrastructure team uh, at Netflix up until a couple of months ago. Um, nowadays, I'm a co-founder CEO at the new company called Outer Bounds, like where we actually continue doing exactly the same stuff like we studied at Netflix. And like that's also related to the topic of book. But um, anyway, let me let me let me t- start by um, telling you something about what happened at Netflix. So many of you know that when you log into uh, Netflix, um, you see all those TV shows and movies recommended to you, and that's obviously a machine learning system that Netflix has been developing for for a long time. But now the interesting thing happened maybe about four or five years ago when they started seeing that there's an increasing number of other use cases besides um, besides these recommendations where the where the company wanted to use machine learning. So you can imagine that like when you are when you are producing movies when you are creating movies there are like tons of tons of things that like need to happen and um, like all the way from from let's say getting the screenplays and understanding what's going on in the in the screenplay and like maybe you can use natural language processing there. Or maybe you can use computer vision to actually understand like what happens in the video and the, and the footage itself. And then of course, like like Netflix being a big global business, there are many many bit more businessy problems as well about predicting churn or like maybe optimizing people's schedules as they are as they are kind of shooting these movies and, and stuff like that. So the point was that um, there was a potentially a very diverse set of of different kinds of use cases where machine learning and, and data science could be used. And now, um, like if you if you happen to be a data scientist, machine learning engineer, like maybe maybe you know techniques like how to apply uh, machine learning, like for natural language processing, for a computer vision, like predicting churn, like for like for any of these specific use cases. But what the book is really about, and like um, like what I want to be talking about today as well, is that okay? So given that like you have many many different kinds of use cases at your company, uh, how do you actually build some kind of a common infrastructure? That helps you to deal with with all all kinds of different use cases. Not only a single one, not only recommendations, not only NLP, but I mean something that's really like common for for all these use cases. And that's that's really kind of an interesting question. That okay, so are there any commonalities? So interestingly enough, if you think about the full spectrum of, of machine learning, uh, on the one end, like you you may think about like re- really classical statistics. Maybe people even use R. They're like classical techniques. Maybe the amounts of data are not that huge. Um, and then in the other end of the spectrum, like maybe you have things like deep learning, like where you definitely want to uh, employ uh, GPUs and like uh, like the amounts of data can be absolutely massive. Maybe you have petabytes of data and who knows what. So in some sense, uh, there are more differences than commonalities between between many of these use cases. And now let's say if you happen to be um, coming or approaching this question more from an engineering angle, the interesting question is that, okay, so what on earth like could, could be common across these things? And uh, and like when we started thinking about it, so like and, and like this is like what the book really um, tries to um, uh, like kind of uh, uh, portray as well that there are like a number of things that are really common and like if we can um, basically build a solid enough foundation, solid infrastructure for all these common use cases that really helps like all these individuals working on on, on different use cases. One of the kind of most foundational things, if you think about it, if you think about all the different machine learning use cases, is that like, well, all of them use data in different ways. So, of course, the nature of data really differs. So it could be that it's images or maybe in some cases it's text or like in the, like in the case of natural language processing, maybe metrics for churn prediction and, and maybe some like a tables for, for like a schedule optimization and, and so forth. So you need, you need some data. So the question is that like, how do you handle data efficiently is, is definitely something that's relevant for most of these use cases, if not all. And the second big one is that um, on the one hand, like you have data, on the other hand, like you want to run compute at scale. So that's that's pretty much given that like one thing um, that is absolutely common, like with all machine learning is that it's, it's really ultimately it's about optimization. It's about like running mathematical optimization algorithms. 
And and like why I kind of wanted to draw the cloud here is that like oftentimes it's it's easier to kind of run this computation in the cloud these days. So the question is that okay, so given some data, how do you run like uh, compute efficiently in the cloud? That's definitely a relevant question. The the second second like kind of observation here is that well uh, like usually these applications besides just like hacking a model in a notebook, I mean they they actually like consist of multiple steps. It's not only one thing that you have to do. It's not only model building, but you also have to do some data pre-processing. Let's say here, I mean maybe for images you have to first like gather the data set and like maybe do train and test split and like maybe instead of a single model you want to build many different models and like maybe then like kind of at the end you want to choose the best performing model. So you get some kind of a workflow with multiple steps. So not only you want to run compute in the cloud, but also you kind of get this DAG or like directed basically graph or some kind of a workflow that you want to execute. And uh, now, of course, like also there's the thing that, well, I mean, any of these nodes may fail. I mean, like you want to make sure that like everything is, is fault tolerant. And like what is really remarkable is that like the workflow, it's not only like one one kind of workflow that works for everything, but I mean, depending on the different use cases, you, you get many different kinds of workflows. Well, okay, so like we have talked about data compute workflows. Well, the, the next thing is that, um, especially at larger companies, typically it's not a single person like building these projects, but you have a multiple projects working together, collaborating. And uh, also it is not so that like you build this thing once and then you deploy it and, and, and then you are like good to retire. So what, what usually happens is that Especially like if, if an application, if a machine learning model is very successful, it becomes this never ending iterative process that like you want to build one, one version of the workflow, one version of the model, then like maybe your colleague has another idea like how they want to improve the model, they build a different version. So now also like a very fundamental question, like when it comes to this effective data science infrastructure becomes that how do you manage multiple versions? How do you like track all these experiments and how do you keep things organized? How do you enable people to collaborate effectively? So those those are kind of really surprisingly big and big questions. And, and interestingly enough, I mean, these are not necessarily questions that are like most exciting, like for, for data scientists and engineers, it's just something that like, in order to kind of uh, um, uh, support like many, many, many different use cases simultaneously, I mean, you kind of have to have to kind of consider like when building the infrastructure. It's also obvious that um, like these machine learning models are not built like from scratch in the sense that like you write, write the code in a vacuum. I mean, pretty much always you use off the shelf, off the shelf machine learning libraries. Like you can use TensorFlow, you can use scikit-learn, stats models, PyTorch. Like there, of course there's a huge ecosystem of amazing libraries available these days. So the question also becomes that, okay, so how do you manage these external dependencies? So now, I mean, all these projects are really fast evolving by themselves. And if you just pip install like things randomly, there's the question of reproducibility. How do you make sure that you can produce the same results again? Also, when the when the kind of APIs change, I remember like when TensorFlow upgraded from 1.0, like kind of a, the one series to the kind of a two series. I mean, they changed the APIs and many existing uh, like kind of a pipelines broke. So you somehow have to provide those stable execution environments. That is that is really really critical as well. So kind of the picture that you see emerging here is that like we have started like we started from very like basic questions about the data and the compute and the workflows and the, and the versioning and then like finally even these questions of dependency management. So interestingly enough, not so many questions related to the machine learning itself or data science itself. It's more like engineering, engineering side questions. So the, the kind of we started thinking that okay, would there be a way to provide all these kind of engineering questions as a, as a kind of a single coherent framework so that the data scientists who are doing the work, they wouldn't have to at least worry about the low level questions all the time by themselves. And uh, now obviously there are many, many different ways of doing this. And uh, like the book, the, the, the Effective Data Science Infrastructure book, um, it is it is not specific to Metaflow. I'm, I'm using Metaflow, uh, that is the open source framework we started developing at, at Netflix as, as a kind of an example, as a reference implementation. But let's say if at your company you are using Qflow, MLflow, SageMaker, like all the themes that apply like to, 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 to any other frameworks as well. So these like questions of data compute versioning and so forth. I mean, of course, like not, not specific to Metaflow or any other, uh, any other framework. But um, like, especially like when it comes to making data scientists productive, I mean, it's, it's really a question of the user interface and like, how do you make this whole thing uh, as kind of a user friendly as possible. Also keeping in mind that at least in the case of Netflix, many data scientists were not software engineers by training. But they, um, but they, they, they were definitely capable of writing Python code. But I mean, like maybe like when it comes to like a DevOps stuff, like a CI, CD, Docker files, and so forth. I mean, that wasn't necessarily like something that was in their comfort zone, nor something that they really like wanted to spend much, much time on. 
So overall, like how, what what the book is is arguing, and I I think like what's a pretty successful way of thinking about these things is that like if you think of all these different components, starting like with the data compute orchestration and so forth, as as a kind of an infrastructure stack that you need to provide. Like on the engineering side, it kind of makes sense to be somewhat opinionated about the lower layers of the stack. So, I mean, very few data scientists were super opinionated about like where the data comes from or like how do you run computer, how do you do orchestration? It kind of feels that it should just work. Whereas then like when it comes to these higher level concerns, like, okay, so what kind of a modeling framework should we be using? And like, how do we actually engineer the features like for the model? And like, how do you even know if the model works correctly? I mean, those are things that, of course, like a data scientist are really the domain experts in. And, and, and they should have more freedom at the kind of the top of the stack. So that's a kind of a good mindset for, for thinking about these things. Anyways, I, I will definitely show you some, some practical examples here. I just wanted to set the stage first. And uh, I guess like kind of a, in, in terms of practical examples, so like one, one like good way of thinking about it is that what we want to do, if you think about a now a, a one of those machine learning projects, data science project, it's that, well, um, you, you like pretty much all these projects start with some kind of a prototyping. Somebody is on their laptop and then they just want to start hacking stuff. And and then like somehow it feels that the goal is that like we have to get this thing to production. Like we have to get this thing to actually like kind of a help help the business like produce some business value. And and oftentimes there's this kind of a simplistic idea that like maybe maybe it is a binary thing that okay so there's a prototype and, and then something something happens and, and then you go to the production and like somehow like things should work. I mean in the old days what oftentimes used to happen is that uh, there may, maybe was one person like a data scientist prototyping the models like doing the research and maybe there was a different machine learning engineer who then like took the results of that research and re-implemented everything let's say in Java so that they could be put in production. The challenge in that case is obviously that now you have two people, you kind of need twice the amount of people to do the work, as well as you kind of introduce the massive gap when the kind of the project moves one, one person to another. So another way of thinking about this thing is that instead of like being a binary choice between prototype and production, what if it was more of a continuum that like a step by step, you can you can start with something simple. And as the project matures, you can you can actually start making it more production ready. And one thing that's really like good to, good to kind of remember is that also the production is really a spectrum, like in some cases. Uh, production can mean that like you are you are like it's just testing a new idea but I mean it doesn't have let's say any user visible like uh, effects it's not that like it breaks the whole netflix.com or, or like amazon.com whereas in other cases it might be that it's it's really critical like the netflix recommendations that it that it always works um, also in some cases it, it, it might be that um, maybe the kind of the, the, what it's meant by production is, is some kind of a let's say a decision support system that like where there is a human in the loop looking at the results so it's not so always so that it's an API that like is consumed by other machines so it comes in comes in many different forms anyway so how do how we do how, how do we start going from prototype to production I mean that is that is the question and uh, well I mean on, on purpose I actually like I drew a laptop here so, I mean, like the, the simplest thing is that you grab your laptop, you start hacking some code. Well, I guess the kind of the first thing I, I, I wanted to kind of advocate um, is that it's actually a really, really good idea to have a, um, a cloud-based workstation. And, and what I mean by this is that if you, if you think about uh, the data scientist, machine learning engineer hacking code, and then there's the production environment somewhere like uh, far away, the challenge oftentimes is that these laptops, um, like maybe it's a MacBook, maybe it's running on like a, a OS X or maybe it is Windows. Oftentimes these production environments, like pretty much in 99% of cases, I mean, tend to be Linux machines. And like very few people actually like use Linux for development. So now already, I mean, there's a quite a gap between the prototyping and production, like when you have a different operating systems and very different environments. So it's actually really convenient, like if you can just like remove that gap um, by, by like kind of a, using something that like resembles a bit more like production environment, like all, already during prototyping. And now you might think that, ah, oh, like kind of a, you have your favorite editor in your laptop and it's of course quick to prototype locally and so forth. And then like these production environments are kind of a clumsy to use. You have to SSH and so forth. Um, but I actually, I think that this, this, this thing is actually like becoming radically more easy. Like I, I think like, for instance, if you think about new environments like GitHub workspaces and, and many others. And actually like one thing I wanted to show you today is that um, if, you, if you look at uh, Visual Studio Code, so this is Visual Studio Code. And what I did here is that this is actually a, a terminal that is connected to a, a remote EC2 instance. As you can see here, it's just a normal EC2 instance. Obviously the, the editor here 
is um, is uh, running locally. So I can like just like edit the code here as usual. I can do whatever, and uh, and then I can uh, run the code. And the kind of the key thing here is that like all these commands are actually like being executed on a remote machine. And this is obviously it being an EC2 instance. It's a Linux machine, so it's already closer to production. But what is really important, like for these data science and machine learning use cases, is that um, it also um, is. You, you can control it using the same um, security uh, like methods like you can use like AWS IAM and, and, and so forth to kind of uh, limit that what kind of data this machine can access and and so forth which can be really really important like when when uh, the kind of the data must not leak and like you're kind of have a bit more you are a bit more careful about data governance so there are many benefits in, in having this workstation and uh, I guess like what I'm advocating here and in, in the book is that like with the modern uh, modern editors IDEs like Visual Studio Code it's very easy to combine the best of the both worlds so on the one hand like you are like close to production by running the actually executing the code remotely while then actually like having all the benefits of having this local editor so definitely something that's a that's a that's a good idea not not too hard to set up there's actually like um, a chapter two in the book that like kind of gives you overview about about this idea